In terms of build form, what we're aiming is for a medium density, um, and as Brad has pointed in his uh, video, a European scale, and, and no one's um, hiding from that. It's an amendment area that's actually divided into 12 different um, sub areas, and we'll go to the map in a sec. Uh, and that there are different heights in each of those different sub areas, and those different heights were obviously a very uh, important part of the work of the Strategic Science Working Group and we went through those in great detail to make sure that we felt we had the right setting for each and every individual environment, whether it be the town square or down one of the major shopping streets or down one of the minor, more mixed-use um, streets. Now, I won't go into this in a huge amount of detail because there's too much information, but that is the, the height use table as proposed and so each of the sites on the uh, site areas on the left uh, has three different elements. It has permitted building height, that's an as of right height at the streetscape, at the street edge. Um, it has permitted building height for areas that would be set back. In other words, uh, higher development can occur where you can't see it from the street, in other words, set back from the street. And then there is the column three, which is the, the area where uh, extra uh, additional height of up to 7.2 metres is proposed. Uh, can be approved uh, subject to performance criteria. And that's the performance criteria that is very much about design excellence. Design quality is required for all buildings. Design excellence is going to be required uh, for to, to basically achieve uh, the column three. And that's where the design advisory committee comes into its own uh, to try and give us that indication. Um, now, in terms of where that applies, in fact, uh, this just gives you a bit of a snapshot of some cross sections starting from Elder Place, I guess railway station, up to High Street. Um, and the blue line basically tells you what you can currently build, uh, which in, in most places is 14 metres at the street, four storeys, uh, and 17 metres in the middle, or up to five storeys. Uh, the black line is if you like, uh, the as of right stuff, um, which says that the new scheme amendment in some areas will be up to 21 metres, uh, in other areas uh, 17.5 metres, depending on the character that's already uh, in those environments or the character that we're trying to achieve. And you can see the raking line gives you an indication about how those uh, higher elements can be set back in the middle of the block. The grey line um, is the uh, extra additional discretionary height, if you like, uh, that can be achieved. And one of the things that will, will be obvious to some immediately and not to all is that you can see it doesn't necessarily have a uh, truncation on it. And that's because, for example, you might want to, through the Design Advisory Committee, uh, have a tower or something like that on a corner that actually is seen from the street as opposed to not seen from the street. Uh, so it's basically providing the flexibility through performance criteria uh, to allow for, um, say, you know, something like the town hall tower that already exists. The inner east end is very different to the rest of the city. Uh, we have much wider streets there. Uh, to give you an example, in the uh, west end we had 10 metres to 15 metre wide streets. In the east end they are 15 and up to 26 metres wide, 26 metres being Adelaide Street. What we did is we actually looked at the ratios of what makes a good city. If you're in a country town you probably uh, find that the streets were twice as wide as the height of the building. If you were in a chasm uh, like New York you probably find the buildings were 10 times higher than the width of the street. What we uh, settled on was a ratio of one to one where the facade height and the street width was around about in balance. And that seemed to us to, to essentially provide the sort of scale that already exists, a scale relationship that exists in the West End, um, but there's also a scale which we believe is, is, a, is one that the human relates to. Um, and so we've generally applied that to the other streets. So where you have wider streets, you might also have slightly higher buildings. One of the important things is we put into particularly the major streets a, a 4.5 metre minimum ground floor height. One of the things that if you notice some of the newer buildings in the last uh, 10, 20 years, very sh squat ground floor heights. Trying to get as much residential above but not really worried about what it looks like at the bottom. We need a much higher ground floor heights and this is a mandate. And again, sort of things developers don't necessarily like, uh, but we're going to mandate it anyway. That's what proposal uh, says. This gives you a feel, so the one-to-one -one ratio uh, certainly exists um, in the West End. There are a few anomalies, like the National Hotel sticks up a, a, a lot higher than the one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, the Inner East End, um, if we use the width of the street, that's essentially how we calculated the sort of heights uh, that are in the scheme uh, proposal. 
So, um, the facade heights um, vary from uh, 40 metres, which is uh, the current for some areas. So there are still some areas where it's going to be left the same, um, up to 21 metres, um, which is 5 to, to 6 storeys. 21 metres is around about the height of the wall store in Cantonment Street, to give you a bit of a, a feel for that. One of the things we also tested was not only the facade height in terms of its ratio, but also what it actually did to any street environment. So does a facade height of a certain height cast a shadow in the street or doesn't it? Um, so there's a bit of a snapshot of what's there currently. This is obviously Adelaide Street, um, Johnson Court uh, there. Um, so this is an idea uh, of the type of buildings that would be approvable under the scheme as it is proposed uh, in front of you. Uh, again, uh, another street, Cantonment Street. Different set of heights, but again, the sense of uh, what, uh, what sort of scale we're talking about in terms of the facade heights at the street level. The extra floor space, if set back, um, there are uh, a number of rules. Basically, it can't be uh, visible from the adjacent street, and I'm talking about that, that uh, black line now. Uh, in those cross sections. We already had that sort of attitude in the current scheme. Uh, we've just lifted um, the, the general heights. So that ability already exists in the scheme and you will see a number of buildings around the city where that already exists. We have the possibility of up to two storeys on the wall stores the site, but that, again, that's probably getting into too much detail. You'll need to go through the fine print in the, in the actual document. Where we're talking about uh, the extra, extra, extra height, if you like, uh, is on these uh, sites. So it's the, the large sites primarily running down Queen Street, uh, which is one of the major shopping streets. So it's not all of the strategic sites, and it's not all of the amendment sites, it's, it's just these. And, and I think there will be rightly a fair bit of debate as to whether that's right or wrong, whether uh, we need to either expand the uh, extraordinary height element or in fact uh, contract it. The performance criteria for allowing the extra extra height, the uh, discretionary height, um, very much will be driven by the design advisory committee comments, um, but it has to be exceptional design. And there's a distinction between just normal high quality design and exceptional design. Exceptional design is going to be a really tough test for any uh, developer to actually make. And simply by having that in there, it forces the developer to say, if I want to go a little bit higher, I am going to need to get uh, an architect who can really produce, uh, otherwise it's just not going to get uh, passed by the design advisory committee. Provision of 10% uh, low income housing, affordable housing. So in other words, another tick box that you need to, to, to pass. Um, it can't have any significant adverse effect on adjacent streets. Now that's performance criteria. So instead of it being, okay, regimented, it's got to be this splayed building and you end up with all buildings with splayed um, roofs on them. Um, it actually says to the design advisory committee, test it from first principles and if it worked, recommend it. If it doesn't work, tell us why. Best practice environmental sustainability. So a whole range of measures that the hoops they have to jump through to get that extra, extra height. Parking, always a hard one. Very hard to, to know which way to go. But basically, the city doesn't want to see a, you know, the city swamped by, by cars. If people are going to be living in the city, they don't need two cars. Um, so one, uh, one way per unit is more than uh, enough. One of the important ones is uh, we're thinking about not having parking requirements for office accommodation as an incentive to try and get more office accommodation uh, built in Fremont. And we actually think that if you get the right balance nighttime residences and daytime workers, that maybe you really don't need to double work. So that's a snapshot. There's going to be many more opportunities to go into the detail. Um, and I think one of the things that I'd like to say in my last um, sentence really is a huge amount of work has gone into this from a whole range of people and they have actually done a hell of a lot of work of detail. So if you're going to be putting in a detailed submission, I really urge you to respect the fact that there's been a huge amount of work so far and actually do the research. Find out what we found out along the way uh, over the last 12 months so that your submission can be, um, I guess, as educated as the one that we've made, which has come out in the form of a uh, proposed scheme amendment. So I think in the tradition of Fremantle, you know, we're all trying to achieve the same uh, end product. Um, we might have different views about um, exactly how we achieve that, but the real important thing is that we do it in a considered way. Um, and I think that's what our strategic sites group has done, I think that's what the council have done, and now it's kind of over to the community. Thank you very much.
suggestion that something like 60 to 70 percent of the projected targets could be met from existing vacant property. My doctoral response to that is we've been waiting. Um, and I think what, what we tried to make clear is that there's no incentives. If you're a property owner in Fremantle right now, um, and if we do nothing, we could do nothing, then, but I mean, there's that clear sense of keep doing what we've been doing, we'll keep getting the same results, which is nothing happening. Um, we could, and so I think it's not, it's not a choice of 60 70 percent by doing nothing and 100 percent by doing something. It's actually, I mean, we will very likely see no more new developments in that part of Fremantle for a long time because there's no incentives for landowners to do so. So we're providing those incentives. So, you know, the issue is can't we achieve the same outcome by four or five storeys? Um, why does it have to be nine? Overshadowing is a huge issue. Uh, those types of things have come through quite strongly. Um, well, the, the heights around King Square, um, when you look at the plan, you'll find that the actual facade heights are the lowest uh, in, the, in the whole precinct. So we have actually uh, identified King Square as an area of, um, I guess, heritage you know, um, significance uh, and kept the facade heights down there. One of the things in terms of overshadowing is it depends on which way, uh, which street you're in and which way it faces. So if you're in uh, Cantonment Street or Adelaide Street, uh, then the height of the buildings there is really important to overshadowing. Um, if you're in Queen Street, the streets that run in the other direction, even if you've got a two-storey building there, you go there in the afternoon, um, two-storey building, because of its orientation, two-storey building already casts a shadow over the whole street. So it's not necessarily going to be the case that uh, by having a, a five-storey building, it's going to be particularly worse than the current situation. It's about providing areas of the city that are full of sunshine at any given part of the day. And we're certainly trying to do that. Uh, I think this one's for you, Mr Mayor. Where did the term European scale originate and how is it defined? And that links in with the question about the Victorian character of King Square doesn't really fit with high-rise nearby. Okay. Um, European scale is, is, is a term just to capture imagination rather than be a definitive term. For those of you who've been to Barcelona or been to Paris, Paris is probably an example in some ways, you have quite a consistent height of around about six or seven stories. Um, and that sense of you get in those old European cities where you have a pretty regular height across the city, it's not high rise in that, Ameri in that American sense of, of, of high rise, or it's actually a, a historic European scale. I think, we, I think most people recognise that. I mean, of course, you can go around and say, well, they're all slightly different, you're right. But the um, second part was King Square. Um, Victoria. 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 And I think that's, well, I think half of King Square do does have that. The other half, has my my building and a whole bunch of stuff that we don't like. And I think, again, I think Alan's very important point about having these different parts of different, different precincts that should have different identities and different heights. And that's exactly what we're doing. Subiaco has recently used a large amount of new uh, development without high rise, mainly two to five storeys. Why does Fremantle Council want to go down the high rise route when it has a very special human scale? I guess I'd start by saying I don't think we are going the high rise route. Any given high road I've seen to put it well above what's going to average between four and seven. Two sites will be up to nine stories if they're exceptional. I think what we're talking about is, is medium right. It's probably more dense in Subiaco than parts of Subiaco, although I would say the next stages of Subiaco are going to be of a similar density. Um, and I would also say Subiaco did a lot of that because they had a redevelopment authority. Mm. Okay. Um, it's a really critical one. Look, I mean, for anyone in the room that thinks that, um, you know, because we've got the GFCs, all we have to do is write it out and then we'll get quality development even at the current allowable scale of four storeys. We had a boom before the GFC. We didn't get any development of the strategic site, not one. Um, and so anyone that thinks that um, automatically the developers are going to walk in and, allow, and, and build new buildings at three storeys or four storeys um, is, hasn't been living here very long. The reality is they're not viable. Um, now the question is not um, whether we should uh, therefore pan to the developer. The, developer the, the question for us is, is it acceptable to have taller buildings if that in part is what it's going to take to get through man and revitalise? Uh, and, and they're the sort of things that we're testing through this process. This is a test process to ask the community and ask the professionals, is it acceptable to have those taller buildings? So what is wrong with them rather than uh, let's just stay exactly the same? That, that's what we're here for. Well, that's there's another interesting question quite closely connected to that, and that's with the diverse ownership within the strategic sites. How confident are you that there will be enough incentive and enough cooperation to allow development to proceed? 
that is exactly the flip side of the same question. In fact, in, I mean, it is a real, well, it's a real concern that we don't do this. And developers still come to us and say, look, sorry, it's not enough. There's no incentive for us, and we'll still get nothing. That, that is a chance. We, or we might get some of them developed. So we still might only reach our 60 to 70% of the target, even with these new amendments. But ultimately, we've got to do what's right for our community, get the balance right and we found, getting the heights right, getting the density right, getting the uses right. And that's what we're doing. Um, DAC and the DAC. Sites will be approved by the DAC, not the council. That's right. Any development over $3 million can go to the new DAP. But what, that's why we've been very clear. That's why we're doing a scheme amendment that will actually lock in some of these divisions. A DAP m cannot go outside of the scheme. So what, what we're locking in the scheme, that must consider and, and, and that's why even making sure that the design advisory committee is actually embedded into the scheme and that quality is embedded in means that the DAP can't approve something that does not consist of okay. Here's a question which isn't a statement. Uh, sorry. Why are developers more interested in East Perth, Subi and Northbridge and not in Frio? Can I tell you I'm working in some of those other places and they're struggling with the same issue? But you might want to talk about why is East Perth and Subi done better than Frio? Um, I think they were interested in those areas because those areas were made available for development and a lot of effort was put in place uh, to ready those areas for development over a very long period of time. They had um, government money spent on those areas. The East Perth Redevelopment Authority, um, the Subi Echo Development Authority, a um, huge amount of effort went in to readying those areas. They're actually funded by Federal government. Yeah, state through, federal. Through the better city like, like everything in Freo, we always have to do it ourselves, but in some ways that's what makes Freo special. Uh, and I think the fact that we are doing it ourselves and we don't have a development authority uh, is one of the reasons why it will be you know, a, a success and in the right vein for Freo. How is our Aboriginal heritage going to be embedded in the plan? Thanks, Mike, for that one. I mean, that, that's a key question, and I think. Um, obviously it's not part of the scheme amendment as such, but I mean, it's a separate process where councils being meeting with traditional owners, um, starting to talk through them about how they can play a stronger role in Fremantle in terms of signing recognition, in terms of land, a whole, whole, whole range of things, but obviously not part of a formal scheme amendment that goes to the plan. Here's an interesting one. Do we want A, more heritage, or B, more functionality? A, last 100 years, B, last 30 years. Um, interesting one, um, you know, uh, at risk of uh, Peter giving me a hard time, you know, um, form does follow function. Um, the buildings that we have, which are called Heritage now, weren't reduced for functional purposes. There were no rules. There was just good manners. Um, and one of the things that, that we are trying to get back to is good manners in architecture, in, in the way in which developers uh, contribute to the environment. And that is why there has been a very strong conversation over the last two years about the developers coming into this town with good manners. And that's why we have a design advisory committee now. It's also why we have been at great pains to go out and speak to the developers and share our vision, our community's vision, with them so that they understand what the basic ground rules are of coming into Fremont. But that hasn't happened before in my knowledge and in my uh, history uh, of this town. Uh, and it's happening uh, on a level which is unprecedented at the moment. So, you know, I know we're putting in the effort and we are asking for, for very good manners from developers uh, and I think they are responding by the sort of uh, architects they're coming forward with, but even in the language that they're using. Um, you know, they, some of them actually do want to do, you'd be surprised, they actually do want to do uh, developments that will last uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and they say that themselves. Now, you know, the proof will be in the pudding, we all understand that. What's the timeline around that? that you're, you're facing? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. Um, perhaps the easiest way is to say we had the East End Amendment approved um, oh, okay. oh, in December last year. And my understanding is we've, we've already got, well, one building is being built there and we have a VA um, pending, um, hopefully, uh, for a new building. So if all goes well, you can probably see a crane in, in the East End. Uh, sometime next year, if all goes well. Uh, you know, none of these things are certain, but from our conversations with uh, a range of landowners, uh, I'd be very surprised uh, if we don't see some of those developments up and, uh, and finish in a five year time slot. Uh, I'm actually pretty confident about that. Uh, I wouldn't put my house on it because it's the development industry, but.
We've got a few more events. I guess the key ones really are the walking tours and the open days coming up on Friday and Saturday, and then most of the interactive workshop where you get to press buttons and actually run again by Alan uh, on the 14th of November, which you must have to be for. So we look forward to those. And of course, after tonight, please, as I said, contact us, councillors and staff, put in a written submission. We really want to hear what you're thinking in that process. Um, so up until the 7th of December. Really, the question after that is, um, we'll come back to us, um, council will consider the um, modification that will happen early 2012. Been off to the NWATC probably by a day or two. So, and then hopefully some the years after that. I just want to say thank you very much for coming um, and for your time and your energy and your challenging, but really interesting.